I wish you a warm welcome to this session about Go. Join us, we Sorry. didn't start yet, so. We switched to English, I hope that's okay. So again, let's start again. I wish you a warm welcome to this session here at API Conference about Go. I proposed this session for this conference because I, let's say, got fascinated or fall in, fell in love with this, with this language a few months ago, approximately a year ago. It was the, uh, I'm traditionally a C-sharp developer. I'm doing a lot of work with, with uh, .NET Core. I'm doing a lot of work with Node.js and so on. And last year I started to look into Go. Why did I look into Go? Well, if you take a look at the latest Stack Overflow survey, you will find that Go is today a pretty popular language. In parts, I think in the, in the question, what is your most loved technology? It's even in front of C Sharp. And that raised my interest. Additionally, I use a product, a program, an open source tool that is written with Go every single day. That is Docker. I'm a big fan of Docker. I can't program without Docker anymore. So therefore, that's another point when I, where I said, okay, I would love to take a look into Go. And so in the last few months, I had, I had to learn a new programming language. And by now, I mean, I'm even more fascinated about Go. And I would like to share this fascination together with you. This session is not about how to write the most complex web API and microservices in Go. I hope you, you read the abstract. This is about my introduction to Go and we will not do any kind of applications, but we are going to implement um, a very, very small microservice, let's say a web API, a few web APIs. And I, I would like you to learn this language and the tooling and the support for Docker and so on based on this little web API that we built together. At the end, as promised, I have a little bit of a larger sample. It's still not production code, but it is a sample. We access a SQL server in the cloud where we're using dependency injection and we set up a more advanced web API. So this will be our final sample and I will also show you how to package your stuff into Docker containers and how to run it, for instance, in a serverless way in the Azure cloud. I'm taking the Azure cloud because I'm most familiar with. So that is the, um, that is the journey for today's session. I have not prepared any slides. You will see a lot of code. We will spend all the time in Terminal and Visual Studio code, so don't expect PowerPoint. We're just going to talk about code, okay? Is that fine for you? Good, fair? Good, let's do that. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, as my development environment, I'm going to use Visual Studio code. Uh, I'm running it on Windows, but you can run it on Linux too. It really doesn't matter. And let me give, let me take um, exactly a terminal here. The first thing, that we are going to implement um, is a very basic version of our application. And I would like to use it to show you a little bit about how a typical Go program looks like. As you can see, I have here an empty folder with a bunch of snippets and I have one file with the extension Go in it. And the first thing that you have to specify if you are writing a Go program is you have to specify the package name and you can import a bunch of packages. This is the first thing where we have to talk a little bit about that, importing. Of course, if we write microservices or web APIs, we need a lot of packages from somewhere. So maybe you are used to um, a NuGet, the package manager for C Sharp, or NPM, package manager for, for uh, JavaScript and TypeScript. What is the package manager for Go? It's GitHub. Go reads packages from source control as source. There are no binary only packages. So something like a lib or a DLL, they simply don't exist. Go applications are built from scratch, from source, always, okay? There is no way of packaging up your Go code into any kind of binary format and put it on a kind of advanced, very elaborated package management. Simply not the case. Everything is read from GitHub. And that makes it super simple to import stuff. Um, if we want to import things, we have to initialize the directory in which we are. Let's do that. Go mod in it, and here we specify a URI, and in my case, that's github.com slash my username slash golang samples slash um, web API intro life. 
So now I got a go mod file and you see this is the name of my package. It's the URL to the GitHub repository if you want. Okay? And if I want to import something from Google, for instance, I'm directly referencing their GitHub account. And if I want to uh, import a certain version of this library, I'm going to reference a, a specific label in GitHub of their library. And with that, it pulls in the source code and the compiler compiles everything from scratch from the source code. That is how it works here in Go. A very big difference to many other languages that you, that you might know. No 100,000 files in a node module directory. I was very glad when seeing that. Good. Next step. So now we have package management. By the way, um, the fact that we have package management at all is pretty new. So it's, it has only appeared in the last few minor versions of Go that you can use a, uh, a module file like that before it had something to do with the directory structure, but let's not... Let's take a look at that. Next one. Let's define a very simple struct. You see, I create a struct and the next thing that I have to talk to you about. Do you come from an object-oriented background? I have bad news for you. Go doesn't have classes. The only thing that Go has is structs. That's the only thing you can do. Do you have things like inheritance? No. You have to aggregate things. So what you can do is you can build a struct, you can build a second struct, and you can aggregate the second struct in the first one. That is how you develop in Go. Go has a lot of very intelligent things going on with structs in that area. Uh, so don't, don't cry for classes. You will see after a few hours of coding with Go, you learn how to work with those structs and you, you don't miss classes anymore. It really works nicely. So aggregation instead of inheritance. Okay, that, that's the idea behind Go here. So here I'm just defining a very simple struct. Let's call it a greeting handler and this struct just contains a name. Good. Now let's define, let's add a simple function to our struct. How do we do that? This is the syntax that we use in Go. Please note that we have this struct greeting handler and it's contained here in front of the method name. And that will add a member method build greeting to our greeting handler. So our greeting handler has now a method build greeting. If I new up a greeting handler, I can say my greeting handler dot build greeting. This is the result that comes back from this method. Okay? This is how you add, um, this is how you add a member. And of course there is a package. If I save it, you see it's automatically imported. This is the default format package that has sprintf and printf and all this stuff that you might know from other languages. I think it's obvious what's going on here, right? Next one, let's add another language here, uh, another method here, I'm sorry. This method, serve HTTP, is also added to the greeting handler, please, but please note what's going on here. Yes, Go has pointers. Go has very, is very strong in terms of pointers, but don't worry, it's not the C++ or C pointer where you have a void star and then you do crazy pointer arithmetics and things like that. It's safe pointers, okay? But the interesting thing is that we can add a method to a struct by reference so we can alter the struct inside of this function. If you take a look at the first one, this doesn't have a pointer so it cannot alter the struct. Interesting thing, a thing that you don't find in every programming language, okay? But don't worry, if you use the pointer syntax here, you can still dereference the stuff with the point. So you don't need to separate between, oh, do I have an instance or do I have a pointer and then use the arrow or the point, everything is dot. It's just a way of telling Go that you want to have a reference in order to be able to manipulate the object. That's the idea of a pointer here. And of course, it's also the idea of passing values by reference, not by value. Because by value means you copy memory. If you do that by reference, you copy also memory, but only the pointer. And that's typically not too much data. Get the idea? Okay, so let's take a look what this serve HTTP stuff is all about. It gets two parameters, a response writer and a request. And you can probably already guess what this stuff is. The request is an incoming HTTP request and the response writer can be used to write data anywhere. So now let's take a look at the response writer. 
I pressed F12, go to definition, and let's take a look how response writer is defined. And the interesting aspects here that I would like to mention is interfaces. Interfaces play a very important role in, um, in Go. Any TypeScript programmers in the room? Anybody who knows TypeScript? Okay, then you already know that in TypeScript we have something different, as in C Sharp for instance. An interface does not need to be explicitly implemented. You have so-called structural subtyping or the more funny description is you have duct typing. I always describe it in the same way. Maybe you have already heard me describing it like that for those who haven't. If I stand here, I say quack, 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 what am I? You take a look at me and say, well, probably a duck. Believe me, I'm not a duck. From an object-oriented standpoint, I derive or I'm an instance of the human class. But still, you look at me and you say, okay, he's a duck. Why am I a duck? Because I sound like a duck and I, I make moves like a duck. So let's call it a duck. And this is how interfaces work in Go, okay? If something implements all the methods and members of the interface, let's call it this interface. It implements this interface implicitly, not explicitly. So if we take a look at the interface response writer, we will find that it has, uh, no, th not this one, sorry, we'll see that later on. So this is an interface and please remember the duck typing stuff, okay? So what can we do if we don't use any any fancy packages from out there? Well, you can take a look and you see we can check the URL. In this case, I'm checking whether somebody is sending me a GET request to the set path. I can access the query string. I can check whether somebody passed in a name. I can write some, some status stuff. I can write some bytes. In this case, it's UTF-8 encoded. Or I just write, in this case, the name into my struct. So I implement a method with which I can set the name of somebody who is to greet using HTTP without any libraries. We'll use more libraries later on that makes it much more convenient, but just to understand what's going on. So this is such a, let's say, a middleware function, something like this. So now we have to use this middleware function. Let's do that. Let's add a main function. And this is the most simple web server that you can build in Go. All I do is I create a new greeting handler, I give it a name, and then I say, hey Go, spin up an HTTP server, listen on port 8080, and this is the handler. The handler function, now if you take a look at listen and surf here, it wants to have an instance of HTTP handler. What is HTTP handler? Let's take a look at it. HTTP handler is an interface. Duck typing, qua qua, can you remember? Serve HTTP, response writer and request. And by accident, we have written a method that fulfills exactly that requirement. So writing our method for my greeter implements the interface without explicitly saying that it's implementing the interface. Therefore, we can use our, meth our object that we created here, here as a handler because it fulfills all the necessarity. It looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, so let's use it as a duck. Get the idea? Very important concept when you do Go programming. And that, that means that you can always add an interface to an existing struct without the need that the author of the struct is aware of that the interface even exists. Get the idea? You don't need to have a fancy base class library that everybody has, de has to derive from. No need to do that. Very similar to TypeScript, isn't it? Okay, good. So let's give it a try. Let's run this thing. We have a tool, go run dot, and it will simply run our application here. Okay, my firewall wants to have an okay from me and let's see, okay, it runs. Now let's give it a try. Let's create um, requests.http file and say get http whack whack localhost 8080 uh, and just call set. Let's see what's going on. Run it and we'll see. Okay, missing query parameter name. This is in our application in the handler exactly this part of the code. You see? Oh, our API is already answering. That's a good thing. So let's give it a try and set a name. Set name equals Rainer. Oops, that's my name. So, 
Good, okay, looks good. So, be brave and say get this one. Any other URL should return a greeting and it does. So, let's quickly recap what we have learned so far about Go. I'll zoom out a little bit so we see and we get an idea. We have learned that it's pretty easy to write a Go program. Just spin up a text editor, write it and use the Go tool to run it. We have structs, no classes. We have no inheritance like that, but we aggregate structs. We can simply add member functions with pointers or without pointers, depending on whether we want to manipulate this stuff. If you want to implement a handler function for a middleware, all we have to do is we have to fulfill a certain contract and then we are automatically implementing the interface and then we're spinning up the web server and that's it. Okay? Good. Now, that was nice, but if you do, um, I could do a similar demo with Node.js, right? Using TypeScript, Node.js would look somehow similar. But now we can compile this guy. Let's do that. Let's say go build. And if we say go build, we immediately get what I really loved when I saw, first, saw Go for the first time. We get a single executable. Not 200 whatever DLLs in a folder, not a node module directory with thousands of files just to run a simple web application. We get a single executable. That's it. We can cross compile. We can compile the executable on Windows for Linux, on Linux for Windows. We can even create a web assembly, a native web assembly um, code and run it in the browser, for instance, and access it via JavaScript. That works perfectly fine. And if we take a look at the size of this guy, this is really nice. It has seven megabytes and that's it. It has zero, and I mean zero, dependencies. You can take this executable, if it would be compiled for Linux, for instance, and run it directly on top of the kernel. You can take a Docker container, a Docker image, and say, from scratch, there are absolutely no dependencies. Everything is baked into this executable. Do you want to ship your application, your microservice to somebody? Ship this executable and that's it. Do you want to build a Docker container? Well, take an Alpine Linux, for instance, copy this executable into the Alpine Linux and you're done. Or even create it from scratch. Well, you typically don't do that because having something like Alpine Linux is somewhat convenient for production use, but you could. Let's give that a try. I would like to show you, I promised you, that we are going to try that also uh, in Docker. So let me quickly copy uh, here a Docker file that I've prepared for this talk here. Let's copy it here. This is the Docker file. Uh, it is a multi-stage build. So as you can see, I'm using the, the ready-made Go language base image. I'm doing the Go build, but this time on Linux, therefore Linux AMD64. And then I'm taking a plain Alpine Linux, nothing special. Copy the created executable, make it executable and run it. <clears throat> Get the idea? So let's give it a try. So docker build uh, trstropic api con dot. Good. Let's run it. Should be pretty fast. Looks good? Good, we are done. We now have a Docker image. Docker images are Stropac API con. Let's take a look. Okay, looks good. Uh, this is the latest, latest that I created just. It's 20, M 20 megabytes. That's all, that's the complete package, including Alpine Linux. So we could even go one step further. Maybe you want to see that, I'm not sure, but yeah, I will show it to you. We could say from scratch, something like this, copy it. Of course, we cannot do that one. And that's it. And it would still work. Definitely. I will not show you. Of, well, I can if you want. But uh, not this one. I wanted to build it. Good. Let's run it again. So we are building it using the ready-made Docker image. And then we copy it. And if we now take a look at the Docker images, now we have seven megabytes. That's our entire application. Well, we can do it from scratch, but we will not. I think that makes it clear what is really nice about Docker. Just a single executable and everything baked in. If you have, for instance, a lot of C or C++ code, it's maybe interesting for you that Docker 
is based on C and C++, of course, and you can bake your C code into Go. So you can take your C files. Go has a very strong interoperability with the C language and C++. And you can run the Go build statement. It will also build your C code and it will embed the entire C and if you want C++ code into that executable. So you still have a single executable even if you want to add some C++ code. That's very important if you're dealing with, for instance, IoT scenarios where you have some drivers or low-level stuff that you have in C or C++. I will not demo that because of time constraints, but if you want to see me doing that in my YouTube channel, just Google my name and YouTube, you will find it. I have a presentation that I gave two weeks ago at Techorama in, in the Netherlands, and there I, saw, I showed um, much more information about the C interoperability of Go, okay? But just as an information. Good. Let's get rid of the Docker file here. We don't currently need it. Yes, that's fine. Let's, let's keep it here. Next step. Let's change that a little bit. So let's get rid of this guy. Yep. And the next one is, oops, no, not get rid of this guy. We first take a look at the main function and look at the different version of the main function, this one now. Yes, exactly. Now, this time, the main function is a little bit more interesting because I'm using a so-called multiplexer. A multiplex, uh, Go has um, a multiplexer built in, the default multiplexer. It's called the serve multiplexer. And what you can do with that guy is you can very simply say multiplexer.handle function, you give it a path like this, so you don't need to write this if code that we had to write before, and give it a handler function, exactly the same handler function that we had before. So the complex stuff that we had up here where we had to manually check the path and so on, we simply don't need that anymore. We can now use this multiplexer and add a lot of paths for which we want to write some code. And in this case, I now just um, work for the set and this one is the, the greeting. And it still works. The, the multiplexer is also um, uh, a handler function, so we can just pass it in like that. Give it a try. Go run, and it should still work. Missing parameter name is good. Setting name Reiner, hello Reiner, everything works now with the multiplexer. Of course, this built in multiplexer, now there is a version of this that makes it even more interesting. This built-in um, multiplexer is really not very powerful. And please bear with me for another few minutes. I will show you a more professional multiplexer in a few minutes, okay? But I think you get the idea, right? The value of this multiplexer is that we don't need to manually check the path for something. Good. Next example. So this time, let me clean up a little bit. Uh, we don't need... Let me clean up so we have a little bit less code. We have that one. Let's take this one. This is good. Now, I'm, create, I'm, uh, I'm creating a variant of this stuff and I'm now using a closure for my uh, handler functions. And I would like to show you a bunch of interesting features of Go in this example here. The first one that I would like to draw your attention to is this one. A function in Go can easily return multiple values. That's not a tuple, it's a language feature that a function can return multiple values. That's built into the language, okay? So what we are returning here, we are just returning two handlers, just to, just to show the point. Then I'm using a local variable, name, and as you can see, my functions here and here, they are local functions, as you can see. Um, these functions are using the name, where do I have it, for instance, here, from out there. So this is a typical closure as you might know it from C Sharp, from JavaScript, and I guess it's also possible in Java. I'm not a Java expert, by far not. Java is something that I don't write, but I guess something like this works in Java too, right? 
Any Java programs? Yeah, you are nodding. That's good. So this is a closure. So this works perfectly fine in, um, in Go. And what I can then do is I can return two handler functions, one for setting the stuff and one for getting the stuff. Now let's add a main function like this. We again use the multiplexer, then we call the greet handler. We could call it a factory because the greet handler returns handler functions. You get the idea? A handler function that closes over the variable name. So now we have returned two handler functions that we can use the, with the multiplexer and they have their state built in. Get that? This is the state and the two handler functions are there. You might not like the fact that we just returned two handlers here. Bear with me for a few more minutes. We will check a little bit later how we can create modules with their own state and so on. But do you get the basic principle here so far? Everything's fine? Good. So here we have two handlers set and get and we just run it. Let's give it a try if the name really works. And when we do that, I would like to demonstrate a little bit of tooling here too. So let's say go uh, run. With go run on Windows, you always get, a get asked for the firewall permissions. If you say go build, create the executable and then run it from there, you are not asked for your permission. It just works. A little bit inconvenient, but it's okay. Good, set, missing parameter, works. Now this one, we set the name Reiner and we run it again, it still works. Well, you have guessed that, you've guessed that probably. Now, what if, we, what if we would have screwed up? Can we debug something like this? Absolutely no problem. I will set a debug breakpoint here and in Visual Studio Code, we can launch the debugger here and add a Go configuration. It's really, really simple. All you need to do, oops, one too much. All you need to do is add a configuration, uh, debug configuration for Go. Visual Studio Code supports that out of the box. And then we just open the file or the application that we would like to debug, go into the debugger and run it. Now the application starts in the debugger, takes only a second or five or so. Yes, we agree. Good, listening. Go to the requests file and try it again. Set it, worked. And now the debugger should break and here we are. So you see debugging is really nice. It really works nicely. And with that, you see, I hover over name. This is the variable that we close over. This is our closure. And we see that the name was stored correctly. Well, obviously it was stored correctly, but I wanted to demonstrate how easy it is to use the debugger in Visual Studio Code if you need to do that. Okay. I'm using a bunch of plugins here. Maybe I should mention them. If we take a look at the plugins, there is, of course, one of the most important ones. It's the Go plugin from Microsoft. This makes it possible. So if you want to do that in Visual Studio Code, just install the Go uh, plugin in Visual Studio Code and you get the debugger and the tooling and so on. And additionally, if you would like to try your web APIs like this, install the REST client. The REST client is a really nice tool in Visual Studio Code. You see the, the five stars here with over 600,000 uh, downloads. That's, that's really nice. I really like the REST client. You can install it and it works really nicely because then you can check in these test requests and you can, uh, yeah, you can use it. it. It's kind of convenient. Good, I see somebody's taking a picture, so I'll wait for a second. Good, no question. No problem. Questions so far? So, yeah, question. Uh, what about uh, all the uh, goods and other requests? Yeah, a very good question. Currently, we don't say whether it's a get or a set or a put. Bear with me, that's the perfect uh, next step for our next exercise and we will take a look at that in a second. Uh, for that, we really have to move away from this uh, serve mux which comes out of the box we have to go to a more powerful router and we will do that in a second okay but a very good question thank you thank you for that any other questions good 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 so 
I will replace the main function because if you take a look at, um, at many articles, blog articles on the web, you will see something like that. And it looks a little bit strange, at least it was strange for me. And so I thought maybe I should describe that a little bit. What you see here is that we are not using any kind of multiplexer at all. We just say run a web server and listen on port 8080 and somehow magically it works. The reason is that if you pass in no multiplexer, the so-called default server multiplexer is used. And the default serve multiplexer is nothing else than the multiplexer you have seen before, but in a global variable. So if you ask me, I, I try to avoid this stuff because everybody could write to this variable. See, I can install a Go package from somewhere and they could overwrite my multiplexer and do whatever they want. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not really a security leak, but I feel better if I have control and I, if, if I explicitly new up my multiplexer and I don't use this global variable. But it's just a global variable and it works exactly as you have seen it before. Okay, good. Questions so far? Good? Nice. So nothing special here. Let's take the next one. The next example, it's built on that. Of course, there is a lot of existing middleware and I added here a small snippet with which you can, for instance, add a static file server to your pipeline. In that case, I'm just saying that I have a directory called public and in this directory po called public, I would like to handle all requests that start with slash public slash. Imagine that you would like to combine your Go web API with an Angular or React or Vue single page app. You can put now your single page app into the public directory and it can immediately talk to the web API with, which runs on slash. You get the idea? Let's try that. Of course, I've prepared something for you. Um, it's here. Let's copy it. Copy the folder. Here's the folder and this folder just contains a very, very simple index.html and this HTML is just using the JavaScript fetch API to call our Go web API, okay? Just so that we see that something is going on. So now that we have a file server and our web API, we can try whether our single app plus API works. Good, it runs. Let's take the browser, localhost 8080, public index.html, and that looks good. That is already the application served by our Go web server, okay? Now, if we take a look at the network, I can enter my name here and click on greet me, and you see it automatically calls the set method, which sets the name, and then it calls the slash method, and it responds with hello, Rhino, and it prints it here. So now we have a combination of, let's say, a single page app and our API. The index.html is not baked into our Go application to make, to make that very clear. So we can still save the, the single page app in an external folder and we can update it without a need to update our Go program. Of course, we could also bake the, bake the, the files into our Go application if we want, but I don't think that that makes very much sense. Get the idea? So, in general, uh, the nice thing is that Go really has a sweet spot in the area of microservices and web development. So, all the, all the um, uh, middlewares that you might now think of, like <coughs> authentication and OpenID and all this stuff, they, they exist. They really exist at a very high quality because we know that Docker is built on this stuff, uh, Kubernetes is built on this stuff, Terraform is built on this stuff, and those applications are really cloud native. They live and breathe. Things like web APIs and things like gRPC, those things work really well in Go and you have a large number of high quality packages that you can use similar to the file server. The file server is built in. You don't need any external packages for that. Good. Good. I will not always build the Docker file to show you that this works really nice in Docker. I hope you believe it, okay? Good. So let's take a look, exactly. So my last demo here uh, that I would like to show you is now a more powerful router. Um, I can remove the rest here. I decided to show you a router which is called HTTP router. I will save it, give it a second, then this stuff should be 
should disappear here in a second come on exactly looks good by the way uh, what's I didn't mention that but I should mention that um, if I write a go program and I write it in a poor style for instance if I write something like x equals 42 if x equals 42 um, format dot print f uh, we have the answer that is a lot but not idiomatic go that's simply not idiomatic go we shouldn't write the parentheses here we should have the the uh, curly braces in the line up there if I save this visual studio code exactly visual studio code will immediately reformat our stuff let me show you what I mean did you see it removed the the parentheses and it let it didn't let us compile while the curly braces are in the wrong line if I put a semicolon at the end of the line it will remove the semicolon again and now comes an important idea of go and this was one of the hardest things that I had to accept you cannot configure this stuff there is no configuration about that the idea of Go is simplicity and consistency. So every Go code in the world looks the same. There is no discussion of whether we should write the if statement like this or whether we should write the if statement like that. It's simply not possible. It's formatted automatically and you get an error if you don't do that. If you write, for instance, a module and you write an uppercase function name, something like open with an uppercase O, then Go considers this open function as exported. And it requires you to write some documentation on top of it, otherwise you get an, a, missed, uh, a warning. Do you want to get rid of this warning? You can't. If you want to get rid of this warning, write documentation. That's somehow the philosophy of Go. Consistency and simplicity. There are, as, what, what do I mean with simplicity? There is something like this, x++. It works, but it is a statement, not an expression. That means I cannot write something like this. It's simply not supported. Why? Because the Go people say, why do we have that? We can write two lines. It's easier to read if we have two lines. Don't be too smart. Get the idea? You cannot do an inline if, something like um, blah, 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 question mark, um, then uh, uh, colon, not, not colon, um, yes, colon, uh, else, I think you know the idea, sorry, I'm missing some, some, very, uh, some vocabulary here. Um, that simply don't exist. Write an if statement if you want something like this. So Go is a very simple language. It's, it has only 25 keywords. My home language, if you want C-sharp, has over 100. That's a big difference. But that comes with a cost. If you write Go, there are some language features that you will probably miss. For instance, there, there are no generics. There is no try-catch. There is simply no try-catch. What does that mean for error handling? You will see that in a few minutes when we go to the larger sample. You have to write an if statement checking for an error whenever an error can happen because the Go designer said we want to have error handling code near the line where the error happened. We don't want to see code where the error happened here and then the exception bubbles up and bubbles up and bubbles up and bubbles up and somewhere the, up there, there is the error handling. We don't want to have code like that. Yes, you can do something like panicking. Panicking is a little bit similar like unhandled exception which is called at the very or handled at a very high level something like this exists but it is not a dry catch it's not the usual error handling stuff panic is really what the name suggests panic you have to stop you have to do some serious cleanup before continuing it's not a typical dry catch so go is simple and go is consistent and why is it like that in an area in a world of microservices you frequently read code but you less frequently write code you maybe join another team and you need to understand as soon as as fast as possible the code that they wrote and if you have written go code before the go code of your colleagues will look exactly the same because it has to understand what i mean some people like this about go and some people don't it's your decision but it is like it is Last one, and then we go into the next example. If we, for instance, look for the Golang documentation about memory management, let's see if I, 
if I quickly find this please read no I will do it this way this document describes the goal memory management read this line and then you understand the philosophy of Go. Just follow the principles of Go and then you don't need to understand how Go memory management works in details. That's the philosophy of Go. Well, if you want to contribute to the Go language, you should definitely understand how the Go memory management works, of course. But as a user, as somebody whose job it is to write microservices, you simply don't need to know. Have you heard me talking about variables that live on the stack and variables that live on the heap? And for instance, in C Sharp, if you define a struct, it lives on the stack. And if you define a, a class, it lives on the heap. And somewhere with a closure, the, the, the variable by value is, is uh, transferred on the heap and all this stuff. You simply don't need that in Go. The, the words stack or heap, they don't exist in the Go documentation. Go will figure it out automatically. It will do so-called escape analysis if you use the variable outside of a function it will not use the stack if you use the variable just inside a function it will use the stack it will do it for you you don't need to understand it it simply works get the idea this is meant with simplicity and consistency and to be honest I, I, I made this talk before on different conferences and sometimes I call this talk coding detox because if I think of where I come from with C Sharp, where we talk about so much about stack and heap and span and whatever, or if I come from my TypeScript and JavaScript world, where really the word changes every week for me, this is really relaxing. It's kind of chilling. It's, it's, it's like holiday. It doesn't change so much. It's easy to understand. Of course, it's limited, but limited for me in a good way if I have to write programs that last for more than a few weeks or more than a few months. Okay? That's the idea behind Go. So back to our example. I just wanted to describe a little bit about the reasoning behind the language so that you have a clear understanding what you will find if you dive into this uh, adventure of Go. Otherwise you might have different expectations. Good. So let's remove this, this bad code example here. Let me see if I have another one here. Yeah, uh, we talked about the, the HTTP router. There, is a, there are many, many different routers out there and I decided to use one which is pretty popular and, and often used, this one. It's called the HTTP router. It's not the only one out there. You have dozens of routers, but this one is pretty popular as you can see, more, more than 10,000 stars. That's pretty good. And how does that router work? It, now it looks much, much, um, much more uh, clear, much clearer than before because this router looks like maybe you are used to Node.js or ASP.NET, it looks like we are used to it. You see you are newing up the HTTP router. Uh, by the way, uh, Go does not have constructors but you can create, you can write so-called factory functions or so-called providers which take some parameters and return a new instance of a structure. That's a constructor in, in Go. So we are using here a provider function which gives us an HTTP router. Then we can specify the verb and this is the answer to your question that you had before. Then we can specify the route template and as you can see here the HTTP router now knows much more tricks. It knows variables in the middle of this, this, um, this route template and then we can specify again a handler function. The handler function looks, you see it up here, exactly as before with one difference. We get the parameters from the URL into our variable, into our function uh, from the HTTP router and we can easily access this parameter in this case by name for instance. And again the HTTP router, it implements the handler interface walks like a duck, talks like, uh, sounds like a duck, you can remember. Therefore, we can use it as any other multiplexer that we had before. It's just another multiplexer. We are replacing the default multiplexer that we had before. Got it? Let's give it a try just to prove that it really works. Stop it. Uh, this time I'm using a, a different tooling now, go build, and we are creating the executable. 
So you see it. And then we say um, web API intro live axi and it runs. Come on. Good request. And let's see. Page not found. Why? Oh, maybe I still. Maybe my my dear friend Docker is still capturing the. Nope, it doesn't. Hmm. Really? It has. Did I change it? Oh my God! Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Oh my God, I forgot my own. Um, storybook for for this okay let's run it again you are perfectly right get HTTP whack whack local host 8080 and this time I'm saying uh, greet name good greet Rainer and if we are right we should see yes it works thank you very much talking and speaking it uh, writing and talking at the same time I'm not a multiplexer so I'm not multitasking uh, capable of doing multitasking Get the idea? Good? Good. So let's take a look at a more complex sample so you see that a, how a, a more complex API looks like. I've prepared such a sample here. Uh, it does um, kind of the uh, kind of to-do list, but I would like you to I, I would like to walk you through the code. First thing, I would like to show you how you can structure your Go applications. You can create sub packages. This is a sub package. I called it to do database. And this database is now using an external, um, oh, sorry, no, using an external package, uh, database SQL, to access SQL Server. To be more specific, the database SQL package is a generic package to access any kind of SQL based servers. You need a driver for a specific database. So you would use database SQL for any kind of relational database and then use a driver for SQL Server, a different driver for MySQL, a different server for Postgres, whatever. If we take a look at the main application that I created for you, you will find that I'm importing here the driver for MS SQL DB. It's Go only, so it's not some wrapper around some Microsoft stuff. This is 100% Go and it works in every environment, okay? So this is the idea here. If you do something like this, it will be automatically added to your mod file. As you can see it here, it is part of our dependencies and I can simply install it whenever I need. So let's take a look at the database file here. It's not depending on SQL Server, it's generically implemented. Now, it takes some, some flags like username and password and so on as input parameters. That is not that interesting. Uh, this is a provider function as you've seen it before. Then we are opening up the database. Nothing special here. You can take a look at the documentation. Now it starts, it's, it, it becomes more interesting because we see another feature here. Please take a look at that one. This, is, this looks a little bit strange, but a Go talk would be incomplete if we don't talk about this feature because this is one of the most important features that Go can offer you. It's channels. What is a channel? Now take a look here. Oops, I should have stayed here. So take a look at this keyword here. We are running a function with the keyword Go and that is running the function as a so-called separate Go routine. You can conceptually think of a Go routine like a separate thread. It isn't a thread. It's not using an operating system thread. A Go routine is multitasking built into the Go runtime. It's a construct of Go, not of the operating system. So even if you compile that stuff down to WebAssembly, WebAssembly is running in the browser, browser is single threaded, we don't have threads, Go routines still work because they are a concept of the Go runtime, not of the operating system. Now the question is, if we run our application in multiple Go routines, think of background tasks, something like this, how can different Go routines communicate to each other? Imagine you get a web request coming in through the router and then you want to do some asynchronous work on the database and when the work in the database is finished, you would like to send something back to the HTTP request handler so that it can send back an answer and you do not want to do blocking I.O. You get the idea? That is where channels come in. 
Channels are a way of communication between Go routines in a type safe manner. So what we can do is we can return a channel. It does not return immediately an error. It just says, hey caller, let's create the connection between us, a channel between us, and I will use this channel later on to send you results. Get the idea? You can send a single result to the caller or you can send multiple results to the caller, kind of streaming from one Go routine to the other. You can use a channel not only from callee to caller but also the other way around. You can pass in as an input parameter a channel and then the caller can stream parameters into your Go routine and you can decide how you would like to handle that. Get the idea? That's the idea of a channel. And in my case, I've written a very simple, um, a very simple function here. It's called initialize. It does nothing else than doing a little bit of database work, creating the table if it doesn't exist. But the point is, it does not block. It will immediately, as you can see down there, return the channel immediately. And then inside of our Go routine, we use the channel to conditionally either return an error or nothing, a null pointer, nil, if everything was okay. Get the idea? Now let's take a look at a second function, <coughs> get all to do items. I implemented that for you. It's the same, but this time we are returning a slice of to do items. Kind of kind of array, collection, slices. We, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about arrays and slices and so on. Think of collection of to-do items. See, we are returning not to-do items, but a channel. We are creating this channel, then we do some database work, and once we are done, we are simply returning the results. Get it? Now let's take a look how this is consumed in our web API. Let's go here. This code consumes this stuff, and as you can see here, this is our handler function. I consciously made it very simple so that you can follow along. The get all to do items does not return to do items, they return a channel. And with that, we can indicate that at this point in our program, we would like to wait until the channel has some information for us. Get the idea? This is not blocking I.O. This is running in a separate Go routine and this operator that I just highlighted here, it will not block the thread. It will just suspend execution <coughs> at that point and of course everything else can start running again and we will not, uh, we will not, um, uh, we will not allocate or block any kind of resources like that. You get the idea? Any C-sharp programmers in the room? Yeah, okay. Async await? Can you remember? It's very similar to async await, but the difference with async await is that with an await statement, you can just return a single result at the end. But a channel is something that you can keep open and it doesn't just work into one direction, it works in both directions. So it is a much more powerful programming construct than just async await, okay? The last aspect that I would like to show you is also very characteristic for Go. What I did, I, I wanted to set up dependency injection. And let me show you how I did that. The first one is a very simple uh, service. You see it here. It uses the so-called flag package. It's a built-in package that is, that is perfect for parsing command line parameters. Yes, you heard correctly. Go has a built-in package for, console, for, for CLI parameter parsing. Why? I mean, take a look at Kubernetes, take a look at Docker. All these things are command line interfaces, so it absolutely makes sense that Go is very strong when doing command line interfaces. And in this case, it's using the flag package to parse username, password, and so on, and so on. And at the end of the day, it returns the parsed results. It is just the settings for opening the database. Get the idea? Good. Now the second thing that I created was the database. And as you can see it here, the provider function receives the API flags. This is the package that we had before. So we do kind of constructor injection. It's not constructor injection because there are no constructors. It's a kind of provider injection. And it will return a database here, right? And then I created a third file, wire.go, 
and it contains an initialized function returning a ready configured database. And what I can tell the system is how all the providers work together. I can specify all my providers and then a package named wire, it's a package from Go, it will do the dependency for us, dependency injection for us. And the interesting thing with Go is that Go is built for performance. So dependency injection is not done at runtime, but it is done at compile time. What does that mean? Please note that I'm returning null from this method, right? Now, we have a tool which is called wire. It's just the generator of Go. And that will give us this file, wiregen.go. And if we take a look, then here we can really read the code. We see that it's newing up the API flags, that it's newing up the database, and it's passing in the API flags here and returning the database. There is nothing going on at runtime. The whole dependency injection is created by generating code at compile time through Go Generate or the wire tool, which is nothing else than a call to Go Generate. Code generation at compile time is a very important concept when it comes to Go. It's also important because you don't have generics. And if you don't have generics, you somehow have to create type safe, for instance, collections or things like that. How do you do that? Code generation. The idea is that we want to have the best possible, uh, best possible performance. So a concept like reflection is something that we want to avoid as much as possible because reflection isn't fast. Whatever we can do at compile time is faster. Get the idea? So this is a good example of how Go is using uh, compile time code generation. Good? Clear? Nice. So. I promised you a last demo and I will do that. Um, I have the Docker file here. So let me quickly build this Docker file again. Docker build minus T R Stropic API con dot. It will uh, build our app into a Docker container. Hopefully I've not uh, destroyed something while working with you on our code. Good, let's push this guy. Docker push rstropic API con, go for it. Good, it's pushing our, uh, our Docker uh, image into the Docker hub. And now I promised you that I show you how we can run it uh, inside, of, um, inside of Azure, inside of a cloud environment. Just so we are sure that everything is okay, let's quickly run it locally so we see that it still works. Yes, come on. So somewhere here, it should return items. And believe me, I have a database. This is the database, by the way. It's also running in Azure and it contains really one record, learn go assigned to Rainer. And yes, it works locally. And we just pushed the Docker image. Are you curious how large it is with whole SQL server driver and everything? No dependencies at all. Docker images, uh, rstropback API con. It's 25 megabytes, including the SQL driver and everything. So we pushed it, so go to Azure, here we are, and let's run it in a serverless way. The easiest thing to run something in Azure, a Docker container, is to use container instances. Um, Azure has a lot of uh, different uh, services with which you can run containers, but this is one of the simplest one. Let's call it API con and run it in Europe. West Europe, here it is. Um, the, the name was rstropic API con. This is what you have just seen me pushing. Let's go to networking. I think we have used the port 8080, so I have to open up the port 8080 and let's call this API con. Is it free? Yes, it's free. API con.westeurope.azurecontainer.io. Good. Anything else? No, I don't think so. Let's, let's run it. Uh, just to give you, while this is, oops, create. While this is deploying, what is Azure Container Instances is the most lightweight serverless solutions for running, uh, for running containers. You can specify uh, resource constraints like number of CPUs and, and memory, but you don't need to maintain any kind of uh, Kubernetes cluster, virtual machines, whatever. You just, you just give the container a certain resource and then it runs in there. 
and you can start thousands of them, Azure will care for scaling it out. By the way, these uh, container instances, they, are, they can also be connected as a virtual kubelet to Kubernetes. So if you have Kubernetes running in Azure, you can say that some of your containers should run in this virtual kubelet and then Kubernetes will start such container instances as it needs to. So the Kubernetes cluster learns to breathe. If you have a lot of containers, it can scale out to container instances, will automatically connect them to Kubernetes and if you terminate them again, it will automatically be scaled down. So with that, you can create a Kubernetes cluster of a certain size and you can somehow, let's say, let it breathe, become larger and smaller just as you like. That's the whole idea of this container instances. And it's already there. Let's take a look. We don't have any mistakes. That's good. Here is the clipboard and let's see if it works. I think I already prepared the host just to make sure that I did, don't have any kind of typo here. I will uh, edit, oops, I, of course I need the HTTP in front. I think I didn't make a mistake here. So let's do that one and let's see whether it works and hooray, it works. This is now running in Azure. Um, this is our container that we created. It's a single executable baked into an image put into the Docker Hub, from the Docker Hub into container instances. And because it's Go, the startup time is perfect, exactly like we would like to have it. So let's put it together, what I wanted to show you. Go is a very interesting language because it is, um, it is simple, it is easy to learn, it is very powerful when it comes to web API, console applications and so on. It is consistent and therefore very, very well suited for a scenario of microservices where you maybe work today on this microservice and tomorrow on that microservice. It is, it is very good in compiling everything without any um, <coughs> dependencies into a single executable and you can cross compile from Windows to Linux, from Linux to Windows and so on. Because you have a single executable, baking it into a Docker container is really, really simple. I showed you that. But simple does not mean trivial. You have seen that you have a lot of interesting packages, like for instance the HTTP router, the SQL database access and so on. All these things that you typically need to write your backend apps are there and are of very high quality. So. I, hoped, I, I hope I raised your interest. I hope you found it interesting. You learned something new. And maybe you are curious how this Go stuff really works in practice. I recorded this session on video, so I will put it online. You can also find the code on my GitHub repository. In my YouTube channel, you find more talks about Go, more introductory level, more showing you step by step the language features. And I hope if you are interested that those things will be helpful for you. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the interest. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the API conference. Thank you. Thank you.